Thanks for taking your evening to come out and listen to. For the next 40 to 45 minutes or so, I was just telling somebody that I actually give this talk pretty much every day that I'm in clinic because education, I think, is actually the most important thing with respect to getting your patients to work with you. And sometimes it's difficult if you don't know what it is that you're looking for to ask the right questions to know when to seek help. And so I'm hoping for the next 40 to 45 minutes, um, I'm going to sort of give you an overview for, with a focus on melanoma, but also actually on the two other types of skin cancers that are commonly encountered, how frequent they are, what to look for, what it is that we do for them, and if at the end if we have more questions, I'm happy to talk about vitamin D and everything else actually that's been in the news. But I think the, the main focus today will be really in talking about recognizing them, why they're important, and then how to proceed once you recognize them. Um, and I guess we'll just go from now and I will speak as slowly as possible. And if you can't hear me, please raise your hand. I have a tendency to get too excited and then speak too fast. So we will, we will see what we can do. All right. So the first thing is I have no disclosures and I have no conflicts of interest. And um, this is a pretty busy slide. And all I want you to get it from is that skin cancer is actually quite prevalent. Over half of every single malignancy, every cancer you see in the United States today are skin cancers. Probably more. I think we're actually underestimating because we're just taking a glimpse of the population. And if you actually just look at the numbers I have written down here, we've got about almost a million that are basal cells, almost 200,000 that are squamous cells, and about 55,000 or so that are invasive melanomas, and an additional almost 40,000 of them that are in situ malignant melanomas, and I'll talk about the differences between the two. So, but however, if you look at the numbers and then you look at like the skin cancer deaths from these cancers, you see that 7,800 or so from, are from malignant melanomas. And there is a uh, disproportionate male to female uh, ratio. However, as we have been in practice longer, we see that actually the number is catching up where there are a lot more female patients with melanoma um, that are catching up to, to the male. And so if you look at just the lifetime risk of melanoma, all comers of melanoma, you see that at least for men, it's about one in 60. And for women, it's about one in 80. And as you all know, women tend to live longer. And so now that we're more aware of these incidences, we're catching up with the numbers of melanomas for women. So I would say for in all intensive purposes, it's quite as, as common in men as it is in women. So, why is it that's important? So if you actually look at melanoma of the skin, you can take a look and see this is by location. And Australia, by and far, leads the pack. But if you just look at the, the list, the US tends to pop up somewhere in the middle. After Australia, you can see Hawaii there in the middle. You see New Mexico. You see San Francisco. You see Los Angeles, et cetera, et cetera. So these numbers actually are a little bit outdated. But if you actually were to reflect them from today, it would be roughly the same. So, and this is important to keep in mind because this is an important factor in thinking about how these melanoma cancers come about and sort of when and where you need to pay attention. So if you just look at all comers, and this is about two decades old, and the reason we don't have more data is because there's so much more now to collect, it's the sixth most common cancer among men. So prostate, lung, colon, bladder, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and then you're talking about melanoma. So if you think about it, it's actually fairly remarkable, even though the skin is the largest organ in your body, but melanoma, as I was telling you, the incidence is quite low. But if you look at it just among each individual organs, it's actually right up there. So even though we tend to think melanoma is something that's a little bit rarer than, um, than your average skin cancer, my point today is to hopefully drill into you that this is actually a lot more common than you think. What about women, you can ask? Well, again, this is about two decades old, but if you look at the data now, breast is far and away the highest, but then you have lung, colon, uterus, ovary, and then melanoma does go up there. And I will tell you, the incidence of melanoma is actually climbing the ladder. So again, this is something of an epidemic in terms of whether or not we're picking up more, whether there's just more incidence because people are living longer, whether there's a factor of more UV exposure, and with time, we just have to sort of be cognizant that melanoma is actually something we have to be very careful about. So what about if you look at just in an area like Los Angeles, if you divide it by race, what do you see? So if you actually see it, the Latino population 
in the black African American population is sort of fairly stable. But an interesting point here is if you were to look at non-Latino white populations, the incidence is going up. And I think this is a combination of cumulative sun exposure as well as the increased awareness and in being able to detect these, uh, these malignancies. So why is it so important that we're talking about being able to detect it? I'm showing you all these numbers and they're just numbers. What does it really mean? So if you look at melanoma and melanoma survival, and I just want you to point you down to sort of the decreasing colors from pink to purple. This is actually classified by the depth or the sort of thickness of your melanoma. We can talk about this a little later in the talk. The more, the more sort of higher the number there, the more significant it is in terms of how it affects your overall survival. So thinner melanomas in most but not all cases tend to have a better prognosis than thick melanomas. And this makes more sense. If you detect a melanoma earlier, it tends to be smaller. Take it out early, then you can sort of follow the patient over time. If you detect a melanoma a little bit later where it's already thicker, then chances are that it already has had some remote uh, metastases or remote movements that you're not aware of and thus explaining the decrease in the survival rate. So if you just to look at this as the same thing now, if you're looking at um, all males, so in every way you stratify survival, whether it's men, whether it's women, almost always you see the deeper, the bigger, the larger the melanomas, the worse outcome you have. So this is not rocket science. If you pick it up early, if you pick it up earlier when it's smaller, you have a better chance of fighting for the patient. So what are the known risk factors for melanoma? So we all know it's ultraviolet radiation. But what else is there? Family history is important. Personal history is important. So when I always talk to my patient is, once you have had a skin cancer, your chances of getting a second one is much higher. And that is because you are already predisposed in some fashion, either from your DNA or from your genetics or from your occupational or leisure exposure, that your amount of UV has already been such that it has already tipped off the threshold for forming a melanoma. So personal history is very important. Family history is important in that a lot of these melanomas have a genetic component. And so you have to consider whether close relatives have these particular genetic uh, disposition such that to make you, when you have the UV exposure, a little bit more uh, uh, predisposed to having that. Other things, uh, it's a Fitzpatrick skin type, and I'll just briefly talk about that. A Fitzpatrick, Fitzpatrick skin type is from one to six, one being the Irish a uh, person who is very easily burned and never tans to number six, the African-American gentleman or woman that never burns and always tans. And so the Fitzpatrick skin type is just a correlation of how susceptible you are to getting the damage, how susceptible you are in terms of being able to fight the UV damage. That is to say, if you have more pigment, you're more Fitzpatrick type six, you're able to then absorb or defend against the UV radiation versus if you were type one, you don't have the cells that make pigment on your skin, then it's a lot easier for you to have the damage. Immune suppression is actually something that's more recent now over the last two decades or so. And there's two concepts to think about in immunosuppression. One is that as we get older in age, our immune system was not originally designed to last more than 35, 40 years. So the reason cavemen never got melanoma is because they didn't live long enough for their immune system to fail them. So as in industrialized nations, as we've lived long enough now, there is a thought that our immune system is no longer able to keep everything in check as if we were younger. So the longer we live, the more suppressed our immune system is or the more senesced or older our immune system is. And this is thought to contribute to the rise in the melanoma incidence. The other type of immunosuppression is sort of iatrogenic, i.e. from the doctor or from the hospital. And this is actually quite common now, especially at a place like Stanford, because of transplantations of organs, bone marrow transplants, and all, all the patients with leukemias and lymphomas that we do the transplants with. The reason you have to immunosuppress them is so that they don't reject the organ you have just given them. But at the same time, this is almost mimics the immunosuppression or immune senescence you see in older folks. And so one population that I pay special attention to are transplant patients because they are functionally basically quite old 
in terms of how the immune system is able to act as a defender or a guardian against the melanoma cells. Age is an obvious risk factor. And then, as I said earlier in the, in the slide, male gender compared to women tends to be a higher risk factor. Although, as I've said, now that women are living longer, we're able to detect more melanomas in females. The ratio appears to be almost one to one. Something that I skipped over uh, on the slide is the presence of dysplastic nevus. The reason I don't want to delve too much into it is because dysplastic nevi is still very controversial. And the lifetime risk is anywhere between 6 to 10 percent compared with the general population without a dysplastic nevi, which is 1 percent. By dysplastic, I mean some, it's something that you see in the microscope from a pathologist, and the description of what the, what the, uh, the mole looks like under the microscope consisted of a collection of cells. So as you can see, differing from one pathologist to another, whether or not something is dysplastic, it's fairly subjective. And so the data, and I think the jury is still out, but the point of the, having it on the slide is that if you have dysplastic nevi, then your chances of having something that can turn into a melanoma is higher. And I'm happy to address this at the end, depending on sort of what the definition is. But I just, want to make sh I just wanted to mention it, but not dwell on it too much. So over the next 10 slides, 10 minutes or so, I want to really stop and describe the, the pictures I'm going to be, be showing you. Because I'm going to be showing you the most dramatic photos, because that makes the point. But at the same time, I want to point out what it is that makes you suspicious and what it is that's really important to, to sort of pick up early. So we're going to go on, and, and I think I have about a series of eight to 10 um, of these uh, images. So the first one I want to show you is a superficial spreading melanoma. And so when you look at this, you'll say, well, this is badness. And, and it, you know, there's nothing specific about it that makes you wonder. The thing I want to point out here is the asymmetry and the borders so you have a little bit of a higher edge at the top. Here, I'll use this. Over here, rather than here, you have a variety of colors. So you can readily identify at least four, if not more, different colors in one mole. And you have a sense that this mole is growing somewhere and going somewhere. So if you look at the edges here and here, it seems like it is actually growing. So when you see something like this, and it's harder for me to make a point because I don't have one that's before, if you see a mole that changes with any of these behaviors, the colors, the indistinct borders, the symmetry, and as well as the size, then it's really important then to, to take note and, and to sort of seek dermatologic evaluation. So I'm going to go to the second one. And the more you see of them, the more you know what I'm talking about. So here, is a, a melanoma that's on the face, and we call that lentigo maligna melanoma. Again, let's just go with the four things I've just talked to you about. The asymmetry, so it's got these ragged edges, indistinct borders, it's kind of fuzzy over this side as well as this side. Coloring, it's clear that this is a multi-layered, multi-colored structure here. is different than this brown color outside. It's a little bit different from this black color down here. And then diameter. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know this is large. And what I didn't mention is E is evolution. So evolution from one point in time to another. And sometimes that is the only criteria that a melanoma meets, is when a patient comes to the clinic and he says, you know, doc, I've had this for 10 years, and over the last two months or so, it's really exponentially increased in size. So that's also another part of history that's important to pay attention to. But I think most patients and providers and primary care physicians are cognizant enough of the changes that they're able to pick it up right away. But again, this is still a very typical example. I have had patients walk in just like this and say, you know, this, these changes came overnight. I mean, I always have to laugh because changes like this never come overnight. But it's important that you are cognizant of the different characteristics of what you should be suspicious about. This is an example of a melanoma that is in an acrocyte, meaning a hand or a foot. In this case, this is from a heel. So there is a misconception that all melanomas need to be sun-related. But actually, the work over the past five to 10 years or so have demonstrated a small population of melanoma cells that can occur in areas where you never see the sun. For example, on the heel, 
and the buttock and the abdomen. These also tend to be found in ethnic groups that are less of the Fitzpatrick one type, the Irish type, and more towards the Latino, darker Asian, and African American types. So with each kind of the melanoma, you can see, let's see if our rule applies here. Well, <laughs> one is asymmetry. You can tell this is a very unevenly distributed lesion. Borders are quite indistinct here versus fuzziness here. What about the color? Well, you have very, very dark colors right over here, but then it's followed by very brown borders on the side with, I don't know if you can see this, sprinkled dark spots in the side. Four or five colors at least. And diameter, I don't have a ruler here to show you, but this is at least four to five centimeters in length. And evolution, if you were to ask the patient, say, well, I started with this small brown spot here, and now it has evolved. So you will say, well, this is kind of difficult to touch. You know, I'm talking about the depth of how, long, how big the melanomas are. So what about some of the other ones that are bigger, that are the more morbid, that have the lower survival rates? So here is one. That's a monodular melanoma. So now, not only do you have the superficial spreading, you have a spreading in three dimensions and the depth. So you can see that this is actually made up of a collection of little bumps or papules that are forming a large lesion called a plaque. Again, our rule applies. It's asymmetric. You have a sharp edge here and a flatter edge here. The borders are indistinct, especially when you come up to this higher part. The color, you can appreciate, it's actually quite pretty. There's one color that's red. There are darker colors, and then there are purple colors. So more than three or four. This is one instance where mon monotony is, is the key. You want your moles to look as banal and as common as possible. So I want to give you a side note. When you're, look, when you're looking at a mole, our body is not, are not very smart. We can only make one type of mole, and that is why all of your moles all look the same. So one tip that I always tell people when they ask me, how do you know? How can you identify these melanomas? Is that you want to find the ugly duckling in the group. You want to find something that does not belong with the rest of your moles, because your body makes the mole the same way throughout the lifetime. So again, this is the nodular melanoma on the face. So evolution will probably be very important here. But again, if you to look at it, diameter, color, borders, and asymmetry. That's very important. So where else can you find melanomas? You can find them on the face. You can find them on the soles. You can also find them on the nail. So here is an example of a melanoma that is actually from the nail bed, nail matrix, and then that's going through to the nail. So this is very important because you want to know that if it's, this actually happens a lot in clinic. People will say, I bumped my foot six months ago and yet this dark spot, this blood spot is not moving. So that is a tip-off in terms of evolution, in terms of changes, and there are a variety of methods we can do, but most of the time you have to get a tissue biopsy. And so in this case you have to do a nail biopsy to be able to ascertain whether or not you're dealing with a melanoma. Here's another example. So here it's, it's a little bit more of an obvious example of a growth on a thumb that is asymmetric, Distinct, indistinct borders, color. So now you can tell this is sort of an amalgamation of blue, purple, and white with a little bit of red sprinkled in. And diameter, this is, has taken over this patient's thumb. So again, this is not subtle, but I think if you use the rules that I've, I've been talking about for the last 10 minutes, you will be able to recognize it when they're a little bit more subtle, such as here. We probably have a lot of bumps just like this. A lot of folks who are on aspirin or blood thinners, or as you get a little older, any trauma tends to leave a darker mark. So how do you tell? Again, just use the simple rules here, looking at asymmetry, looking at borders, looking at color, and looking at the diameter. A more obvious one is this next photo here. Again, if you look at it, you will say, well, it's not so bad, but apply the criteria. Symmetry, borders, where it becomes really quite indistinct on the side here. <coughs> Color, this here is a heart-shaped mole with this darker asymmetric lesion. And then diameter, and evolution. 
most likely in this case, the patient had the heart-shaped mole for a long time with one corner that eventually developed. So I'm, I'm belaboring a point here, but I just want to make sure that, that we get the point across. So here it is again. You have a lesion. Again, it's asymmetric. Borders are indistinct. Colors, diameter, evolution. So in these cases, where it's quite obvious, it's very easy for you to pick it out. And it's those subtle cases that if you're wondering about is when you would actually seek dermatologic help. And we have a melanoma clinic both at Stanford and at River City that we routinely see patients for evaluation. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over what it looks like under the microscope in the interest of time. So this is actually something that we have educated with the American Academy of Dermatology just to tell people. And I've already went over this, so I just wanted to reiterate this again. Asymmetry is super important. Just find something where you can fold the lesion in half. If it doesn't look right, if it doesn't look even, then you have to be suspicious. Again, border irregularity. If you see jagged edges rather than smooth, continuous edges, that's a cause for concern. If you have different colors, then you can understand that some evolution in the mole is actually ongoing. And the last is diameter, which goes with the evolution. Any sudden growth, any mole that's actually larger than six millimeters. Although data has been shown over the past few years that the size, as long as it's consistent and not changing too much, is actually a, an okay indicator. But diameter, larger the mole, the more worried you should get. So besides sun exposure, what are the factors that are risk factors that one needs to pay attention to from the DNA, the genetic perspective? Here are the inherited risk factors. <coughs> Excuse me. If you have fair skin, if you have blonde, or if you have red hair, if you have freckling, especially from a young age. What's most important, I think, is the tendency to sunburn because that's really an indicator of how susceptible you are to the damages that can be conveyed by the exposure to UV. And something that is questionable is whether or not intermittent intense sun exposure is a risk factor. And by this we mean what happens if, it's, if you didn't work on a farm and had continuous UV exposure, but you only got the heavy UV doses whenever you went to Hawaii as a, as a young adult. And there's literature and data on both ends arguing for that it doesn't matter the duration of exposure, it's the intensity of your exposure that matters. But there are also data that argues that it's the cumulative uh, UV exposure that is the important determinant. So until we understand more clearly how the melanomas actually work, I think there will be a continuous deba debate about this. But needless to say, the more UV you get, the more UV exposure you have, the more likely you are to be a, a, a fell victim to, to having a melanoma. Talking about genetics though, what about familiar syndromes? So I think all of us probably know people who have a lot of moles or family members who have a lot of moles. And actually there's a syndrome that is well described called the familiar melanoma syndrome where it's autosomal dominant and where the gene has been identified and it's a gene that is involved in the cell cycle, meaning how cells transition from proliferation or multiplication to other cells and stoppage or arrest in cell growth. So the CDKN2A gene has been uh, discovered as very important in telling the cell whether to go, to continue to multiply, or for the cell to stop and to stop multiplying. So in this particular syndrome, in very young children, you can see a typical nevi, so moles that are larger and with both a flat component as well as a raised component. Macules are flat and papules are raised. You probably have read about kids who have 50 to 100 nevus, as well as nevi that are really large that likes, that's like a bathing trunk. And so that's all possibilities within this particular syndrome. If you are one of these patients and you have a family history of melanoma or any other kind of skin cancer, you have a much increased chance of developing melanoma yourself by age 50. And this is through studies from a large cohort of families from different continents with different UV exposures. The different UV exposure is important because you want to make sure that it is the genetics that is responsible and not solely your exposure to UV. So, and this kind of melanoma can appear in places that you don't usually think about. 
in the eye, for example, um, it's a difficult part to get sun exposure. And it's certainly a very difficult part for clinicians and patients alike to try to check and follow a mole that's in the eye. An eye that's an internal melanoma. If I were to tell you I have patients who have liver melanoma as their primary, you would say, well, the liver is inside the body and never sees the sun. But because of this genetic DNA predisposition, it's something that we actually see in our patients who have this mutation and who have this syndrome. Just to illustrate, though, you can see up at the very top, you have patients with lots of moles, different sizes, and different shapes. And here at the bottom, we're trying to illustrate the possibility of having uveal and retinal melanomas, which actually we, don't, we see not infrequently in these patients. So one of the uh, risk factors that I was talking to you about earlier is immunosuppression. So how much of a risk is really being immunosuppressed? Data has shown that it's about three to six fold. Patients who have under organ undergone organ transplants I've talked about. Heart has the highest risk, followed by lung, liver, and kidney. So the reason heart has the highest risk is because you have to have the highest regimen, the most number of medications to immunosuppress the patient so that they can retain their heart and not reject it. <coughs> what else is considered immunosuppression? Folks who have undergone chemotherapy. And this makes sense. People who have had malignancies, you're going to destroy the cancer cells, but you're also going to destroy your cells that make up your immune system. So folks who have immune, or currently or have had a chemotherapy regimen in the past are at increased risk compared to the average Joe of having a skin cancer, more specifically melanomas. HIV, so this is actually a very interesting one, <coughs> but it makes sense if you just think about the basic tenet, which is how your immune system functions and how well it functions. We know that in hu the human immunodeficiency syndrome, you have a decrease in your T cells. And T cells actually have been shown to be very important in immune surveillance, i.e. being the guardian in the body against these kind of changes in moles, changes in, in their cell types, and changes in your skin. So you will see increased incidence of skin cancer, including melanomas, in HIV patients. What's more interesting is that if you treat the HIV patients, the risks only decrease slightly because even though you have treated it, the, fact, the very fact that they have had the infection has changed the way their immune system interacts with the environment. And of course, chemotherapy definitely linked to increased number of uh, moles. And there are chemotherapy drugs that make you more susceptible to the sun in which case you then get an increased extra UV dose whenever you are out. So all of this is fairly common sense, but what's most important is the concept that your body takes a very big role in fighting against these maladaptive changes. And so it's really important to take note once we get older, once we have chemo, once we have prednisone, which is another immunosuppressive medication, it's important then to understand long-term your immune system does take a hit. So talking about the causes, talking about how to recognize it, what do you do? <clears throat> what can you do? Well, there's four major therapies that when you present to us, when a melanoma patient comes, we can do. One is surgical resection. We'll take out as much of it as we can with a lot of border as much as we can. Secondly is chemotherapy. There's more data now, over, actually over the past month or so, that the FDA has approved a new chemotherapy drug that has shown to prolong the lives of metastatic melanoma patients by two months, from nine to 11 months, I believe. And we can talk about this in the QAA session because we don't have time here. One can, one can say, wow, that's really a significant jump in two months. But that also points out to how poorly we're still doing in terms of fighting this disease. You can have radiation therapy just like any other cancer, as well as immunotherapy, meaning an immune system-based therapy to fight against the inflammation that is present or not present when you have melanoma. So in the next five to seven minutes or so, I'd like to go over each one of them just to give you an idea of what it is that we do once you identify a melanoma. The first is surgical excision. 
This is the gold standard of choice. It doesn't matter if you have a melanoma that is 0.1 millimeters or 4 millimeters. This is almost always the first thing we do is to take away the bulk of your tumor. So for something that is melanoma in situ, which is the melanoma that is confined to the first layer of your skin, we take 0.5 centimeter margins, meaning we take the entire lesion out plus 5 millimeters all around its circumference to be sure that we take enough of cells that we can't see by eye. What about it's below one millimeter? Then we take a little bit longer now. So from an invasion of the melanoma from the top layer of your skin to the second layer, we take twice as much of a margin. So instead of taking five millimeters, we take 10 millimeters or one centimeter. So if you actually think about it, just draw a small circle on your hand and then draw a one centimeter margin. It becomes actually quite a large piece that we remove. And the reason is you do not want to take any chances to have any residual melanoma that can still multiply and grow and travel around once, once, it, once it grows. And so the larger your melanoma is, the more margins we take in this direction laterally as well as the, the depth-wise direction. And when we cut out a melanoma, you always cut the melanoma to the level of the fat. So if you think about other cancers, which I'll mention briefly at the end of the talk, we just cut it to the level of the dermis, which is really the second level of your skin. But for melanomas, because of their aggressive behavior, because of their ability to travel fast in all dimensions, we go down to the level of the fat, even to the level of the fascia, which is the, um, the, the lowest level before you actually get to your internal organs. Here's a photo of a typical melanoma excision. So this is the melanoma. So if you look at here, this is, melanoma is about one centimeter across, but if you pay attention here, it looks like it took a little more than one centimeter. So just by looking at this, you can tell this was not a good melanoma. We had to take at least one centimeter all around the lesion to ensure complete removal of the primary lesion. And the way we usually do this is we make a circle around the melanoma itself. We take the circular piece out, and then we cut an additional piece to make the entire surgical margin an ellipse. The reason dermatology surgeons do this is because it's a lot easier to close an ellipse than it is to close a circle. If you've ever tried to close a circle, you know you would have dog ears that would bunch up on the side. So this is actually both for closure as well as for criticalness of getting the correct margin. And as you can imagine, for large melanomas on the face, this becomes an issue because you run out of real estate. So you have to say where the location is and then mark your margins with respect to the border. So we do this all the time and this is the first thing we do. And you might hear in other newspapers or tele television shows, in addition to excision, <coughs> you have to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So what does that mean? Well, all that means is for a particular type of melanoma of particular thickness, and this is always changing, so the idea is to not memorize the, the numbers, the idea is just to know the higher risk your melanoma is, the more likely the patient is to receive a sentinel lymph node. And this entails injection of a dye into the original melanoma that you find because all of our skin cells drain to a lymph node. So the head and neck tends to go from the nodes in the neck, the abdomen tends to be in the nodes in the abdomen, and the arms tend to be in the original lymph nodes, and the legs tend to be in the original lymph nodes. So one would hope that you're catching the melanoma at such a time that it hasn't quote unquote moved away from its original source. And that is important. So what you do is, if a lymph node is positive, then a complete dissection is usually the way the surgeons would like to do. I.e., if you inject the dye and you trace the melanoma and it has already traveled to the lymph node basin where it drains, there is a high likelihood it has already traveled elsewhere. And the only way to ensure that is to really do a thorough dissection of all of the nodes that you find in the area. Either it's in the axilla from a melanoma of the hand or whether it's in the neck from a melanoma of the face. The surgeons will do a dissection to find every single node that is positive 
send it to pathology so you can see it under the microscope to determine whether or not your melanoma has spread to involve uh, the, the uh, local lymph node system. This is very specific, but it's not sensitive, meaning that you are not going to be able to pick up all of the metastasis because, frankly, the technology is just not there yet. So this is basically surgery and lymph node biopsy, which is an <coughs> adjunct in surgery. So what else can you do besides that? Is there anything else you can do for these patients? One of the things that I mentioned is immunotherapy. So I'm going to skip over radiation because that's essentially shooting x-ray beams to the area that is involved for the melanoma. I'm going to skip chemotherapy because right, as of right now, chemotherapy, we don't have any directed chemotherapy. Chemotherapy kills out all cells, including the melanoma cells, but it also affects your normal cells. What I want to mention for a couple minutes is immunotherapy. <coughs> and this is something that's actually relatively old, but over the last five years or so has come to the, to the forefront of news. A lot of laboratories, including the NIH at Stanford and Harvard and everywhere else in the country, were looking at the signals. So remember I discussed immunosuppression as a big factor. So how do you boost the immune system so that the immune system recognizes the melanoma as foreign and treats it as such and attacks it and helps the patient eradicate the cells? So people are looking at lymphocyte killer cells. People are looking at tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, i.e., your immune system cells that recognize the tumor as tumor and ramp up your immune response. People have looked at interferon uh, alpha. People have looked at interleukin. The point here is there are a lot of signaling pathways in your immune system that is active once a patient has melanoma. And now there's active research in thinking about how to utilize these mechanisms to help the body fight the disease. And this is actually an active area of research, and I think over the next 5 to 15 years we'll hear a lot more about that. The problem with this kind of research, and I'll just say it up front, is that you have to have a large number of patients. And you have to have a large number of patients double because you have to do a controlled trial. So one can imagine the numbers that I quoted to you earlier is quite small compared to the rest of the cancers. So out of that group, <coughs> excuse me, a very small percentage has metastatic disease. So then you will have to have, and this becomes an ethical question, how do you have two groups such that you can prove that immunotherapy works? Unfortunately, with a scientific, with a scientific method, case studies and occasional stories from different melanoma surgeons are not enough as a scientific evidence base to really affect change in, in treatment plan, in treatment regimen. So this is an active area of research at the NIH where they are getting enough numbers. They are able to treat the patients with a standard chemotherapy plus the immunotherapy. So this is a very active area of research. And as I mentioned five minutes ago, um, the FDA has just approved a new medication that actually can prolong these patients' lives by two months. So you can tell this is a stepwise process from understanding how the melanoma forms, understanding how your immune system deals with melanoma, and understanding how to take, take advantage of that response to melanoma. Okay, so the last 10 minutes or so, <coughs> I'm just gonna move really quickly in talking about even more common cancers that is not melanoma. So I hope I've given you a picture of what melanoma is, where it comes from, what risk factors it is, and what it is that we do as physicians to try to deal with patients with melanoma. But now I'll tell you what I do almost every day, and that is non-melanoma skin cancer. So in a big umbrella, there's really two types. There's melanoma, and then there's basal cells and squamous cell carcinoma. And overwhelmingly, they are 95% of the non-melanoma skin cancers. So if you think about this, there's a million cases <coughs> a year in the United States every, every year. And actually today in clinic, I think I might have picked up five or six out of 35 patients. So it's actually very common and it's probably underreported and underdiagnosed. The good news, despite the increased prevalence, is that these tumors rarely move. Unlike melanomas, which I've told you can move in every which direction, basal cells and squamous cells rarely metastasize, i.e. they rarely go far away from their cell of origin. They tend to be, however, locally destructive. By that I mean because they don't go away far to faraway places, they tend to stay and grow at their place of origin. 
And this is especially a large problem in healthcare in the United States in that almost $3 billion every year in healthcare is spent in taking care of these melanoma skin cancers. So this is a big problem and I'm hoping to argue that prevention is actually going to be most cost effective to decrease morbidity and mortality. So basal cells. The incidence, again, as with melanoma and any other skin cancers, has been moving up. So I think this is due to the expanding population. This is due to time that has passed since patients have been exposed to the sun in the 50s and the 60s, as well as an increased <coughs> awareness and detection. So I'm going to skip over New Hampshire, but this just gives you an idea from one state. The numbers are quite high. And I just want to point out here that as you get older in age, you get a lot more cases in both men and women. So this is from the 1980s. This is from just 10 years later. So you can see the astronomical jump in the number of cases now that you see a percent change overall up to 50 to 100 percent. So this is an explosive increase in the number of cases that you would see. So this is for basal cells. What about squamous cells? You see the same thing. Up in the higher age group, again, taking into consideration now age, cancers that are not skin, so immunosuppression, organ transplant patients, all the risk factors go up higher with patients whose ages are higher. Again, here you see men and women really an exponential increase. So I'm going to skip over the next few slides, but basically this slide is, is showing you disease-specific survival in terms of months in non-skin cancer deaths. So actually, it's, it's pretty good, 70% survival. Remember, I don't know if you remember compared to the melanoma curves, the melanoma curves actually went down here. So for squamous cell and basal cells, we're actually doing a better job, but clearly not yet good enough because it's not one. So I'm going to skip over this one and talk about basal cells. How do you recognize them? They've actually been around for almost 170 years. And they actually were used to describe initially in the 1850s by a dermatologist as a rodent ulcer. <coughs> it's actually kind of an interesting name because that's what exactly it looks like in the majority of the time. And as early as the 1800s, a series of these cases have been published. So you have to imagine this combination of ultraviolet light, combination of the immune system that really gives rise to these cancers. I'm going to show you a few photos. Here is a typical basal cell. It's pretty pearly. It's on the background of sun damage. And if you really imagine, this looks like a rodent has bitten a piece out of the center. And that's why it's called a rodent ulcer. Again, the most important thing to know about these guys is it's locally can be very destructive and aggressive, but they rarely go elsewhere. Another picture of a basal cell. Here it is again, pearly, with blood vessels feeding in, and again, in the background of sun damage. Here's a photo from a younger patient. <coughs> Not as much sun damage, but again, very well demarcated ulcer-like growth in a sun-exposed area. And I'm going to quickly go over because I'm running short of time. Here it is again sun damaged area, a symmetric but sort of pearly looking papule. And here it is again, in sun damaged area, a small ulceration with indistinct borders. So basal cell is very common to recognize. This is what it looks like under the microscope and we'll skip. And squamous cell, melanoma, basal cell, squamous cell. Squamous cell was actually described in the 1770s. And so what does it really look like? And I think some of you, if you've been to the dermatologist, you have seen this particular device, which is a liquid nitrogen. Squamous cell is thought to arise from precancerous cells called actinic keratosis, which are the scaly red bumps that you can see over the ears, over the forehead, and over the hands, anywhere that's been sun exposed. If left untreated, a small percentage of these precancerous lesions can turn into larger squamous cell carcinomas. 
So actually, I tell my patients, in Australia, these little rough patches are left untreated because the majority of them go away. And only small percentage, less than 5%, over a span of 10 years do they turn into any bad, badness like a squamous cell. However, in the US, we don't take any chances and we treat them all. And I think the data is there that the more aggressive treatment of actinic keratosis, the better outcome in terms of decreasing the number of squamous cells in the patient. So this is just a photo showing the different forms that the squamous cell can take. This is in transplant patients. So again, transplant patients have immunosuppression. The immune system is not quite as young and robust and active, so you're more likely to succumb to the damage. Here is a cancer. Here are rough patches of cancer. And again, this one probably didn't come overnight, but here is an eroded cancer of the toe. More photos, and I'm just going to go through this really quickly. You can tell in a background of severe sun damage, sometimes it's very difficult to pick out what's cancer and what's not. And that's the only real sure way for us is biopsy to obtain tissue so we can examine it under the microscope. Another one you can see is on the lip. <coughs> so why is it on the lower and not the upper lip? Well, it makes sense because the lower lip receives more sun. This is especially the case in smokers where the lower lip is, is notorious for having an increased number of squamous cells. Whether it's from a combination of tobacco exposure versus UV exposure is unclear. But what is clear is that smokers have a higher chance of getting UV-related squamous cell carcinomas. So you can draw your conclusions when you want to. What are the risk factors, and I want to quickly end with treatment at the end. The known risk factors for non-melanoma screen cancers like basal cell and squamous cell is essentially the same. <coughs> UV radiation, sun exposure, Fitzpatrick skin type. Again, the Irish person is much more susceptible than the Latino or the African American patient. History of previous skin cancer. When you have a multiple hit hypothesis, once you have it again, the chances of you having a second one or a third one is much higher. Male gender, although this is beginning <coughs> to be obliterated as, as female numbers of cases increase. Reduced immunity, so again, I cannot harp on enough. If there's one thing you take away today is the role of your immune system that plays in the, in, in the etiology and genesis of these cancers. History of radiation exposure, so this is actually a very interesting one. So let's say you had radiation for prostate cancer. A lot of the patients now, 10 years after radiation, 20 years after radiation, at the site of their radiation, they can develop basal cells and squamous cells. And so why is it that you say? Well, the radiation itself is basically a large dose of UV-like exposure and UV damage, UV-like damage to the skin. And over time, the checks and balance system of your immune system fails such that now, you have a predisposed area with enough insult to have the cancer. Again, long-term or severe skin inflammation also has been thought to have a very significant impact. By this, I mean people with lichen sclerosis, which is a long inflammation in the genital area. Over 10, 20 years, they have a high, significantly increased risk of skin cancer. And all of this is just to bring to the light fact that the role of the immune system is super important. If your immune system has worked really hard for years and years and years, it is unable to keep that level of biological function long enough for you to be able to catch these aberrant or bad cells from forming. HPV is a recently um, described and recently identified risk factor, the human papillomavirus in the, Lee, um, in the lay press, as you see in the vaccine for cervical cancer in young women. So HPV has been shown to be really intimately related to the squamous cell carcinomas. And as I mentioned already, smoking is a risk factor. So what do you do to treat? And very quickly before we end, imiquimod is a medication that is topically applied as a cream to treat skin cancers such as basal cell or squamous cell, <coughs> as well as the precancers such as actinic keratosis. It makes a, makes, takes advantage of your immune system to stimulate a reaction, robust reaction, to destroy the cells rather than having an exogenous means to destroy the cell. <coughs> Excision again, 
is something that you cut out. So it's a lot easier. We do the same principle as melanoma. You, take, you outline the cell, you take the margins that are appropriate, usually five millimeters, and then you take it out depending on the location. Electrodesiccation and curatage is a method we use commonly for squamous cell in situ as well as basal cells, and that requires burning and scraping the cancer cells. And then the last thing is most surgery, which is a one-day procedure where painstakingly you take as little tissue as you can around the cancer such that you spare as much of the healthy tissue as possible. So let me say that again. If you have a basal cell or squamous cell on your back, your surgeon will gladly take five millimeter margins because you have a lot of real estate. However, if you have a basal cell right on the tip of your nose, it is unclear how much to take because you can take two millimeters or five millimeters, but that makes a difference between having to give somebody an entirely new nose or not. And so most surgery, it takes layer by layer to absolutely delineate where the cancer is so that you can take all of the cancer without taking any of the normal tissue. I actually don't know how much time I have. I think we're up. So, I, so I'm happy to take questions, but I think the, the most important thing, so I'll just go over what EDNC is really quickly, and then we'll, we'll stop here, and I'll take questions. Electrical desiccation and curatage has been around for 50 years. This is what we do at the Veterans Hospital all the time. It's easy, it's quick, it has a, as good a cure rate as excisions for some of the cancers, and it has a minimal healing time. So this is one such device. It basically conducts electricity, so this is what we do. We numb the patient up, you scrape, around the cancer cells. So the reason you scrape is because cancer cells are a lot softer and more malleable than normal human cells. So by feel, you're able to delineate exactly where the cancer border is. And then you basically burn the underlying dermis of the skin and then you do the scraping several times to ensure that you have a complete removal of the cancer. <coughs> Sometimes, if people, if you have patients with comorbidities, this is an easy way to take care of. There's no stitching, there's very little follow-up, and the wound heals actually very nicely. And to say, when do you actually use most surgery? This is a patient with a basal cell right underneath the lid, so this becomes a real estate problem. So you cannot whack out five millimeters on each side because you will be taking away the entire infraorbital cheek of this patient. And so what you do with most surgery is then you really clearly delineate how far each of your pieces are and you take a look at it under the microscope such that if one margin is positive, you only go back and take more from that side. In this way, as I've mentioned before, you save as much normal tissue as you can while taking out all of the cancers. And so I will just end with this slide. Here is a patient with not, not such a nicely located basal cell. This is what happens after you do most surgery. So instead of taking everything out blindly, you're able to delineate how much of a border you take. And this is actually after reconstruction. This is a flap where you move part of the skin from this side to fill in the defect on that side. And this is the patient two to three months after surgery. So the goal here is for curative excision while maintaining form and function. Um, I think I'll stop here because I've been talking for a long time. I'd rather talk to you rather than talk to myself. Um, so I hope today, at least in 45 minutes, I've given you a pretty broad strokes on where the cancers come from, how to recognize the cancers, why you get the cancers, and then what it is that dermatologists and dermatology surgeons do to get rid of the cancers. And I think understanding that and understanding how to prevent them. And actually prevention is really easy, which is why I've decided not to talk about it, because prevention is really being very careful about your sun exposure, how much, when, and how you're being exposed. Um, so I'll stop here and I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes, sir. Actinic keratosis, yes. if that uh, is the diagnosis, what normally happens afterwards? So. The question is what you do, oh, the question, the question is what do you do with, uh, if you received a um, diagnosis of actinic keratosis. So actinic keratosis, as I've mentioned, is a precancerous form, not a cancerous form. And so the treatment actually of choice is to have the lesions treated by liquid nitrogen, uh, 
which is a very cold gas that's compressed that can be locally applied to the lesion and that actually is a destruction. So you kill the precancerous cells by having the cold temperature break the cells open. And so if you were to go to a dermatologist, he or she would probably treat your actinic keratosis if they are few in number with liquid nitrogen. Sometimes it takes only one treatment, sometimes it takes multiple treatments. Alternatively, if you have actinic keratosis that is more than a handful, <clears throat> instead of freezing every single one of them, which can go up to hundreds, your dermatologist may decide, I want to give you a chemotherapy, meaning I'm going to give you a cream that stimulates your immune system and takes out all of these precancerous things. And imiquimod aldera is one such option. You do it for four to six weeks. You usually look fairly red because the idea is to stimulate your immune system to the presence, to the, to the understanding of these precancerous cells, and then for your immune system to take over and take care of it. Um, so I think most of the time you will have local destruction in liquid nitrogen, and then rarely you can have field therapy. Is the chemo uh, location specific, or uh, does it uh, work for the whole body? Uh, the question is whether the, chemo, um, uh, the, the field chemotherapy is what you're referring to. Whether the field chemotherapy is location specific or not, and the answer is no. Um, the, I'm actually a proponent of field therapy because I think it really gets rid of all of the precancerous cells that you can't see. So in addition to the ones you can feel, it also works on the ones that have not yet come up to the surface. And so you could use that anywhere. But most often I use it on the scalp, on the central face, and the hands. But it's not location specific. It works anywhere. It's a great question. Yes, ma'am. How do you recognize it on the liver? <laughs> how do you re so the question is, how do you recognize melanoma on the liver? And I apologize for bringing that up earlier. The answer is you can't. Um, actually, that's not true. So if you have a good primary, primary care physician, and I'm not going to go into what, what makes a good primary care physician and what doesn't, but if you have somebody who is conscientious and who checks you for the symptoms, if you have a liver melanoma, chances are your liver enzymes will be elevated. And so if you complain of abdominal pain, if you complain of changes in quality, if you become jaundiced, a little bit yellow, you will be able to find that something is, all ch is changing your liver function, and very rarely it could be from melanoma. But most of the time it's from hepatitis, most of the time it's from alcohol, most of the time it can be from liver cancer rather than melanoma, but it's rare. The usual way people find melanoma is when it has already metastasized. So when you see a few new dark bumps, you take a biopsy, it shows melanoma, <coughs> then the dermatologist's role is to find where it came from. So we do, pe do, do PET scans, you do scans of whole body, and oftentimes you can find that's where the liver is. I have actually personally seen liver melanoma and gut melanoma. So again, in the gut, unless you actually have a micro or sort of a scope, a camera in there, it's almost impossible for you to find. So in that case, you have to rely on other systemic uh, symptoms and signs to, to diagnose them. Thankfully, it's a very rare, very rare uh, occasion. Yes, sir? Is a mole and a nevus the same thing? Uh, the question is whether the mole and nevus is the same, and I think it is. Um, <clears throat> I like the term nevus better than mole because I think anything can be called a mole. And nevus actually has to do with a collection of cells that actually make pigment. Um, so anything like a seborrheic keratosis, for example, which is an age-related, sun-related barnacle growth that, I see a, that we see a lot, um, some people call that a mole. And I feel like a mole is an interchangeable term that is too grab bag um, of a term that doesn't really define what it is that you're looking at. And whereas a nevus has a specific connotation both clinically as well as under the microscope as to what exactly it is. But you'll see it used interchangeably pretty much everywhere. And I caution again, so I would say nevus rather than mole. Uh, sir, and then you. Is it possible uh, uh, to make a diagnosis uh, by just a visual uh, view of the patient, or do you have to send it to pathology for a you know, cellular analysis? The question is whether it's um, possible to make a diagnosis of melanoma or of all I think cancers. The better, the better way to frame the question uh -huh. is uh, uh, obviously the slides that you have are pretty gross. 
in, in, in a case in which it's not necessarily so obvious, uh, it's not uh, black mm -hmm. and so forth and, and irregular like that, it, uh, is it, it, when, when, you, when you remove the mold, you always know when you remove the mold that it is a melanoma or you have to send it to the laboratory to make a confirmation. So when you, when you say you remove a mole that hasn't been sent to the laboratory, is that correct? It has not been sent to okay. the laboratory. Right. So if I understand you correctly, the question is, can you make a diagnosis of, say, a melanoma by visual inspection rather than having to always to have histologic diagnosis in cases where it's not a slam dunk? Is that the question? It's, yeah, or, or do you always need to send it to the lab to make the determination? So that is actually an interesting question, both medical legally and medically. So let me answer it from the medical legal perspective. In the litigious state that is America, it is always, you have to send it because you have to document that you have histologic microscopic evidence of skin cancer. So, so, so that's that. So, so for, by formality alone, that answers my second question is, and it's also, it's also good medical practice. You have to document the reason you're doing a big surgery like this is because you have found melanoma in the first place. I will tell you, for a trained dermatologist or a trained professional, I can recognize a, a nevus with a help with a handheld microscope in the clinic that is likely to be a melanoma. And we're usually about 50, 60 percent correct. And that's, that's actually pretty good because melanoma, it's very difficult. Even if you send it to different people, different pathologists who look under the microscope, the diagnosis may come back differently. So there's a variety. So there's a difference in interpretation as well as clinical interpretation. And so if in doubt, I almost always do a biopsy. Um, some people can do what's, act, what's called watchful waiting. Um, I'm more of a kind of a proactive kind of guy. I think if you're worried about it, if I'm, I don't feel comfortable about it, we should remove it and have it in the microscope. And, and the other thing to think about is, the, if you are not, if, you, if every time I biopsy a mole it comes out to be melanoma, then I'm not biopsying enough. You need to really pursue all these ones because of the uncertainty in interpretation and uncertainty and, and sort of the, the variety of diagnosis you can get. So, do you use a, like a shade or you don't do a punch uh or do you do a punch type of blade removal? So the question is whether or not we use a blade to shave off the mole or whether we use a cookie cutter uh, instrument called a punch biopsy. Um, that depends on the size. So you can imagine I cannot do a punch biopsy on a gentleman's face if the melanoma is five centimeters large. If it's a, a typical mole that I'm suspicious about, I always try to remove the mole in its entirety. The reason is you want to give the pathologist, who is the doctor looking at the microscope, as much information about circumscription, i.e. where the borders of the mole is, so that they can have an idea of the overall behavior. This is, it sounds kind of like magic, but they have a gestalt of what the mole looks like as a whole. So in that case, I try to do a punch as much as I can. In cases like where it's on the face with the lentigo maligna, for example, all you need is a representative shave and you should see the behavior. Although there is, there is, I should mention, conflict in the literature about which one of the methods is best. It also depends on the location of the mole. It also depends on the comfort of the dermatologist performing the biopsy and the competency of your pathologist. And when it metastasizes, does it go through the bloodstream or does it, uh, is there a different process? In other words, when you, when you do the surgery, there's a chance that the cell may go into the, the, the blood, the bloodstream, I would think. I don't know. The question is, by what method does melanoma metastasize? And I don't think we know for sure, because we know there are at least two. It's by blood, because that's how you can find liver melanomas in the foot, and by the lymph node. And that's the whole reason you do the sentinel lymph node biopsy, and that is through the lymph and not through the serum or the blood. There is one method, school of thought, that it does, it does it through the tissue itself. So there are some melanomas that can travel just without blood, without limbs, and just by physical, physical connection or physical advancement. Uh, it's not known yet, so we're, I think there's an active area of research, but metastasis come in multiple forms, and it not only applies to melanoma, it also applies to squamous cell carcinoma. So you can really make the correlate between melanoma and squamous cell in terms of how they metastasize.
Yes, sir. Does prior a cancer occurrence, prostate specifically, predispose one to, uh, to skin cancer or not? Okay, um, so the question is whether or not um, presence of a prior malignancy affects one's chances of getting skin cancer. I think that's a difficult question because it requires an understanding of what the prior cancer is, what kind of treatment has been done, what the person's uh, UV exposure history is, and what the person's age. How about the radical? I'm sorry? Uh, radical prostatectomy. Oh, okay. Um, it's difficult to predict, but as far as I know the literature, having had a prior solid organ cancer alone does not increase your risks for skin cancer. But it's very difficult, as you can see, to do that kind of study because once you have a prior cancer, most likely you'll have surgery, most likely you'll have chemotherapy, and then you're running in the list of the risk factors that you would get to get skin cancer. So it's kind of a chicken and an egg question, but if you just look at people with prostate cancer alone, for example, no, there's no increased incidence. But you, it's very difficult to find a 65-year-old white male with prostate cancer that's never been in the sun. <laughs> I, think, I think that's, so you see the complications of, of having to think about that kind of a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, let me try to ask. Covering, covering the mole. Cover the mole from the, okay. So the question is, um, do moles persist throughout the lifetime of the individual, and whether there's anything you should do to protect it? I will answer the second question first. I don't think it matters um, if you specifically protect one mole against another. What's actually more important is you protect everything because the damage is non-discriminatory. Um, but nobody has ever protected one mole and then exposed the rest of the moles and then try to see. So I think, I think theoretically, it's possible that you will diminish the damage to that particular mole, but I, I think in the bigger picture, it doesn't make a difference. And the answer to your first question is, moles tend to persist through life up until your immune system changes. So it's possible that once you get older, your immune system changes, it recognizes your previous mole as foreign so no longer itself, and so it thinks it's something that's different than you, and it starts to attack it. And we see this actually a lot in nevus that start to have a little white rim around it called a halo nevus. And that's an inflammatory reaction, and that's something to think about to present to your uh, physicians, because changes in moles after the age of 28, 30 or so should, should bring cause to concern. Things like itching, redness, bleeding, in addition to all the things that we talked about earlier. But to, to not have to think about all that, just protect all of your moles. So I think that's the easiest way. Yes, miss? Do TNF blockers like Enbro or Humira, do they enhance the development of melanoma? So that's a great question. The question is, do biologic uh, medications like TN uh, tumor necrosis uh, factor alpha, which actually has been used to treat psoriasis, people with Crohn's disease, people with rheumatoid arthritis, does that predispose people to developing melanoma? So, the answer is, I think it's unclear, because there's not enough of a longer term follow up because these agents are so new, and a lot of these immunosuppression, immunomodulation agents take multiple, like a lot of years to develop in terms of changing the immune system. But actually, we know that it does give you increased risk of non-melanoma skin cancers like squamous cell and basal cell. But again, small numbers over long periods of time, like 15 to 20 years, but it doesn't, it doesn't surprise you because you are decreasing the individual's immune system and it doesn't make sense that now they're more predisposed to having skin cancers. But melanoma specific, I don't think the data is there yet. Do we one, one room for one last question? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the VA doctor. Do you consult at the Palo Alto VA so, work there? So, so the, the question is whether I work at the Palo Alto VA. Uh, the answer is not yet. Because Stanford does too. Yeah, St Stanford does too. Yeah. So, so I think one of the missions of a university is to provide as much care to different populations as possible. So, for example, at Stanford, we cover three major populations: one at the Stanford Hospital itself at Redwood City, two at Santa Clara Valley, which is more of an indigent population, immigrant population, people who don't have insurance, and three we work at the VA. And so, and and there we take care of the bulk of the veterans. So all of our trainees and attendings rotate through all of the sites because we think that is the best way to get the best experience <laughs> and also to provide the most care for our patients. So we do.
so the last question is whether or not sunscreen works. Um, I'm biased. I, I think sunscreens work. I don't think, I think there's a difference between sunblock and sunscreen. And I think that is where the difference has to be distinguished by the individual. Nothing blocks the UV. So if you stay out the, in the sun long enough, you will get the damage whether or not you burn. And so the, the criteria from the FDA and everyone else is what kind of UV are you blocking? Are you blocking the A spectrum, the B spectrum, the C spectrum? How long do you block them for? And what's actually in the blocker? Is it actually a chemical factor that shields, or is it a factor that actually interacts with the UV? So it's, it's taken us a long time as dermatologists to try to really fight the label from a lot of these companies as to what exactly a sunscreen is, but they do work. We have shown that the damage that your cells experience is dramatically decreased with the proper application, the right amount, the right type of sunscreen. So I think, I think the jury is certainly not out, but certainly we want to be able to classify the types of sunscreens that we use so that people know what it is. So I think the SPFs is completely useless. I think the SPFs is misleading because it tells you how long you can stay out in the sun before you get, you get burned. But nobody applies their sunscreens the same way. If I were to tell you how they test it in the rabbit, they smear this thick of a layer of sunscreen on a rabbit and then they say, well, this is an SPF 30. But you and I smear this much, so clearly we don't get SPF 30. And so the number becomes meaningless. I think what's more important is duration of exposure and what exactly you're being, you're being protective of. I try, to, I try to follow the 20 minute rule between 10 and 4. Mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, and protect myself as well as I can. Uh, is, it, is that a fair uh, mm -hmm. uh, limitation? In, so the question is, is the 10 to 4, 20 minute rule a fair limitation? So coming from a dermatologist, I will tell you, I want everybody to swim at night and never go out during the day. But clearly that is not possible. Um, I think for folks who burn very easy, and this is a general rule, for people who burn easy, you want to reapply sunscreen every half hour to, f to two hours when you're going to be exposed to prolonged UV. If you're hiking and I always say get a sombrero-like hat. A baseball cap is useless in terms of protecting your face and, your, and the back of your neck. Um, but for darker skin types, I always say just be cognizant of how much exposure you get, how easily you get burned, because it's always a give and take. The more you get, the more likely you are to suffer the consequences of exposure. But unfortunately, our Irish colleagues tend to get more of that than, than not. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great thank question. You.